Hi, and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to teach people about crypto. Today, I'm going to be continuing my in-depth explanation of 4chain. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe as I have more 4chain or 4view videos planned. In the last video, we talked about how uh, liquidity pools worked. We talked about swappers, liquidity providers, ARBs, the function that they do, uh, you know, with regards to, to bringing pool out of balance, like swappers do, and then arbitrages, bringing the pool back into balance. And then we also had a look at um, a bit more about CLPs, continuous liquidity pools, and a slip-based fee, and um, how 4chain tracks uh, your particular, I guess, um, addition to a liquidity pool using liquidity units. Now we'll turn our attention to nodes. And when looking at nodes, there is a lot to cover. Um, when doing the rundown, this is quite a long list to get through. So it will be cut up into three separate videos. So this video will be covering what nodes do, where to get some information, the requirements for a node, where they're stored, um, some of the risks and rewards, and an in-depth look at the, the composition of a, of a specific node. The next video will cover the different vaults within ThorChain, as well as the incentive pendulum. And then the last video will cover the churn process, TSS, as well as overall network security. So before we get to uh, the node specifics, let's have a look at um, some more information around nodes. So this is the Delphi dashboard and we can go to uh, network and nodes. We get some information here, 36 active nodes. Um, it's currently on over bonded, that's the incentive pendulum. And we can have a look at, uh, you know, how long to churn. We'll go through that in another video. And these are the actual nodes, uh, their, their version, how much they've bonded, how long they've been um, within within the network. And these are the standby ones. These are the ones that I want to get into um, the active state because it's the active state is where they earn the rewards. You can also get more information from here, just this dashboard, and this has the same list of 36 active nodes. Um, however, you can actually click on them and get a bit more information about that node. So they have a, an address, it's like a Thor address. Um, you have one of them as well for the native room. It's their status, um, what block height they got entered, the version, um, whether or not they've been jailed for bad behavior, whether or not they've had slash points. That's because I wouldn't say they've done something bad, but um, I haven't done you know everything 100% right. We'll go through some of the risks or penalties. So they'd be penalized for some reason. Um, and that's the current reward. I think that's in Rune. And um, yeah, just a bit more information about a node you can find out about you know, any node that's, that's currently um, active. And it's, it's all here. So let's think about, well, where do these nodes run? How do they work? Nodes use a technology called Kubernetes to a Kubernetes cluster that gives it some um, failover. So if one part kind of falls over, there's, it's not completely dead because node op or nodes need to be up 24 seven all the time as the network is always running. It can't have downtime or go to sleep or go offline for maintenance um, uh, in an unscheduled manner. It's got to do that very planned else it will get penalized for not um, doing the job that it's there to do. So nodes are deployed within a uh, infrastructure provider, like a cloud infrastructure provider. First one's around AWS, and now there's many others, DigitalOcean, Azure, uh, Google, so, which is really good. That, that gives a distribution of cloud providers. Um, so it's not just dependent on one. So once you've decided on a, on a platform where you want to deploy this into, who your cloud infrastructure provider is, the code is, is pretty much the same. So you just download this from GitHub and you execute this uh, inside um, of a, ideally a Linux terminal. And then off you go, all the code's the same, and then you can deploy a node provided you know, you've got all the right setup and, and stuff like that. So nodes do take a, quite a lot of um, compute and storage, um, huge amounts of CPU and RAM uh, is required within these, um, within these platforms. So you're looking at easy, you know, $1,000 to $2,000 a month in order to operate one of these nodes. Um, so it's quite a bit of a, quite a bit of investment and quite a, a heavy piece of kit to, to keep them operational. And as I said, they need to be operational 24 seven, um, particularly node operator, otherwise you will be penalized for not, uh, not running one. 
I do recommend having a look at my uh, security video here. This talks about, um, it's got a little nice little picture, nice little picture of the different parts, you know, your admin computer, what that needs, the actual cluster or the cloud provider, how that works and the interaction within your wallet and the node operator. So check out that security video. Also create, I've created a YouTube instructional video series on how to create a uh, Thor node. So if you, if you do want to run one, you're not quite sure, um, the resources are there available. If you're thinking, what skills do I need? We'll talk about skill sets here, like you know, advanced knowledge of Linux and Kubernetes, which is like containerization, a bit like Docker. I think if you, you know, really willing to learn and look at YouTube channels, um, look at my instructional series, uh, you probably can get up to speed on that. Um, but understand, if you want to be a, a, a node operator in in multi-channel chaos net, any chaos net mainnet, it is more like a business. It's got to be there, um, you've got to be on call. It's like a full-time deal, even really as a, a testnet operator. Um, so, you know, do take it seriously and don't think it's something you're going to do, uh, you know, willy-nilly. Um, as a fair bit of knowledge and skill is is um, required and as a mainnet or a chaos net operator, if you're not there being responsive, you can lose income or actually start to lose funds. As And as a testnet operator, um, obviously you're paying to keep that infrastructure up. So now I just want to talk about the services that run on a Thornode. So I want to go through them one by one and it kind of mirrors this Thornode stack, although the names have changed a little bit here. And this will give you a bit of an idea of what's inside of each Thornode. This is my very high level picture. First, we have the Thornode service and that is for the Thorchain blockchain. And that is the Cosmos SDK powered uh, blockchain or the replicated state machine and there's a, a lot to learn even just with that with how it uses Cosmos and Tediment um, but that'll be a, probably a separate video then we have the gateway service and the gateway is a proxy for the IP so all the services can you know, utilize the gateway service and get an IP to communicate to the outside world next we have uh, Bifrost and Bifrost is a bridge between Thorchain and the external chains, you could say between the ins inside world and the outside world. So it observes what's happening on, on these external chains and then converts on-chain messages or transactions that are specific to ThorChain into a standard message format that ThorChain understands, which is then recorded onto the ThorChain blockchain. So you could say it uh, does observation and does translation uh, for what's happening between the inside world and the outside world, and then sends that to here to be written on the ThorChain blockchain. And what I mean by that is, if we go here, um, ThorChain has an understanding of what is stored within the actual vaults. We'll cover that in a sec, like what it's actually holding, the funds that it's holding, and what it actually believes it has, what it expects to have. So that what's recorded will be on the uh, ThorChain blockchain and what's stored will be in the physical addresses or the, of the actual vaults that it has. So it has to have that um, accounting and understand that you know, there shouldn't be any difference. But um, that's how it knows when you query the system, you know how many funds it has. Um, it, it records all that information. And just to touch on this a bit, it does require, it's not about what I know, just saying, oh, I saw this and, and you know, that being um, considered what's happened. It does require two thirds of the nodes to agree what's happening. So they all need to have to observe this and come to a, uh, a consensus of what's happening before the network kind of treats as that or believes that that's actually what has happened. But more on that in a, in a later video. So then we have the external um, external chain full nodes. Bit of a mouthful. So we have the Binance chain, and this would be a full copy of the Binance blockchain. And it would sit there and listen, observe, and see all the, the relevant transactions that's happening um, on the Binance chain. And that's how currently BEPSwap works when you interact with your um, BEP2 assets, including BEP2 Rune. Um, it's all done on the Binance chain, and, and Bifrost is observing what's happening when you're um, adding liquidity, withdrawing liquidity, swapping from one asset to another asset, all that's happening on the Binance chain. And then Bifrost is observing that and recording what's happening here within the um, Fortune blockchain. And then in multi-chain, there will be Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin. 
all being full nodes, all having a full copy of the uh, chain. So just looking at the sizes, uh, Binance chain is about 500 gig, so like half a terabyte, that's, that's pretty big. Then you have um, Bitcoin about 370 odd gigabytes, Ethereum about 205 gig, Bitcoin Cash about 153 gig, and Litecoin about 33 gig. And you can see the relevant sizes here. This is for Ethereum. So this would be, it's about 305, 305 there. So that's how you can get the size. Actually, it's about 306 now. That's how you can get the size of each um, blockchain. The node needs to store a copy of every blockchain that it connects to. So again, that's more RAM, that's more CPU, and a lot of storage that needs to uh, happen for, for each node. And looking here, I just zoom in here a bit. This is all the pools that are currently in um, multi-chain testnet. So there we have um, Binance Cash, BNB blockchain, uh, Ethereum blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain, and then Litecoin. So whilst they might have different assets, like you've got Ethereum, USDT, which is Tether, um, it's all it's on the Ethereum blockchain. So it has to have a full copy and understanding of what's happening um, within the Ethereum blockchain in order for this pool to exist. Obviously, um, you know, if you have Ethereum Tether as well as Ethereum Ether, then that, that kind of makes it a bit easier. Every connected, every connected chain needs to uh, run a full node in each, each full node. So next we have Midgard and Midgard enables uh, well, information to be drawn from ThorChain and then that gets used on dashboards such as ThorChain.net, uh, RuneStack Info and the Delphi dashboard. It is a layer two REST API that can be utilized by anybody to extract information from within uh, ThorChain. And looking at this, this is uh, this pool information is from Midgard and there's a whole API, zoom out here, so there's lots of, yeah, lots of different information, global stats or whatever, you know, you can just go ahead and say, get, I don't know, these are global stats and put that in and then tell you the information and there you go. This is obviously to test that, but the same type of thing, um, version one uh, does exist for ChaosNet, obviously version two for multi-chain. There's also a Midgard Timeguard DB, which is kind of like historical stuff for what uh, Midgard currently has. If you wanted to know what you know the state of events were uh, yesterday, last year, or whatever. So looking at this, this is taken from these are the actual pods that are running on a multi-chain testnet node. Uh, I think it was taken like one or two weeks ago, and we can see here we have the Bifrost. So that's what does the um, observation of external chains translates from the external chain specific information into what Thor chains understands. You have the Binance node, the Bitcoin Cash node, the Bitcoin node, Ethereum node, the gateway, and that's the uh, the proxy for the IP. Then you have the Litecoin uh, node, Midgard, which you saw Midgard, Timescale DB, so historical Midgard information and then the Thor node which is the actual uh, full node for the Thor chain blockchain. So that is actually what you'll see as a, a node operator um, if you were to have a look at all the pods running uh, with inside the node that you would have successfully deployed. So these are some of the penalties that uh, node operators can get. This is some of the risk of being an, uh, a node operator. So essentially without going into all the details they have to be um, always on always observing always making sure um, or seeing transactions validating transactions else they're going to get penalized and they call these slash points the slash points essentially take away from their income it penalizes them reduces the income that they're going to get and if they uh, accrue more slash points than the income that they've generated then it's going to start to take away from their bond more extreme cases, if they try and steal funds from their secondary vault, from the Yugodasa vault, then it's definitely going to be taken away from their uh, their bond. His unauthorized transactions, 1.5 times the transaction value. So there are risks, whilst it seems good for uh, node operators. Um, you, yeah, you do need to be on, you do need to be doing, know what you're doing, else you can get uh, heavily penalized um, for, for doing the wrong thing or just not being present. So lastly, I talked a little bit about how funds come in. They come in, they, you know, they're observed by within the the uh, Bifrost, and then that gets written to the uh, blockchain. And I just want to talk a little, touch on a little bit how uh, funds are moved out of the network. So here we see a um, a transaction or a request to withdraw that goes through to the relevant client. This is the chain client, 
and then that goes to TSS and then is you know if it's authorized and approved and everyone kind of agrees of, of what you know the state should be then that is written through using a, um, a written out to a full node um, in order to become a transaction on the actual chain so essentially it moves from a request from um, within the four chain uh, blockchain it was actually a transaction at that point through to an actual um, transaction on say the Bitcoin blockchain or the Binance chain so therefore it then is an on-chain movement kind of moving from the internal world through to the external world so you might be thinking well uh, what is TSS and how does that all work and that's going to be the subject for the next video where we talk about TSS and churn and how they um, interrelate but for now, you can just think of it as sort of like the gatekeeper for the Asgard vault. Um, many ways to kind of think about it and ensuring only valid transactions are processed by the network, particularly ones that take funds from the Asgard vault and put it out to the relevant chain. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something from this video and have a better understanding of how nodes work within Thorchain. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe for more content like this. If you have any questions or if there's parts for you that are not answered or a little bit confusing, let me know in the comments below. And until next time, thanks, bye.